Many are rejecting the Rittenhouse verdict, saying the justice system is racist. Is this critical race theory in action? Welcome to America Uncovered, I'm Chris Chappell. Last week, Kyle Rittenhouse was found not guilty on all counts. However, some weren't happy with the jury's verdict, especially those who realized how many fights this is going to cause at Thanksgiving dinner tomorrow. Some activists said there was no justice in the verdict. A group of progressive congresspeople known as the Squad said our justice system is broken. The ACLU of Oregon called the verdict a travesty of justice, which might be confusing to some viewers. Kyle Rittenhouse was given a trial. The prosecution and defense each made their cases, and he was judged by a jury of his peers. Isn't that how the justice system is designed to work? If that's not how you judge guilt or innocence, how do you? Trial by media? Trial by public opinion? Trial by combat? You know, actually, I'm strangely okay with that one. The problem is, Critics of the Rittenhouse verdict see the justice system as fundamentally flawed because it's racist. There is no justice in a racist system. The Rittenhouse verdict was painful affirmation of systemic racism. Salon says Kyle Rittenhouse's murder trial stinks of the white racial frame, which is a way of normalizing and naturalizing white privilege and white power. Now, unless you already hold that view, you might think someone's trying to gaslight you. Sure, racism exists, but what they're talking about is completely uprooting the U.S. justice system. And not in the way I'm advocating, with trial by combat and judges in Iron Man armor. The idea that the U.S. justice system is fundamentally racist and needs dismantling stems from a worldview built by critical race theory. To understand the backlash against the Rittenhouse verdict, you need to understand critical race theory. So whether you're liberal, conservative, or libertarian, hold on to your hats. Today we're going to do a deep dive into critical race theory. Right after this quick commercial break. Welcome back, unless we've been demonetized. There's been a nationwide debate about critical race theory, but what is it, really? Let's start with its historical background. It began in the early 1970s when two academic philosophies merged. The first philosophy was legal realism. It teaches the U.S. justice system is not, in fact, impartial, unbiased, or objective, because in reality, judges and juries make legal decisions for extra-legal reasons, like political, personal, or emotional ones. Makes sense. Juries are made up of people, and people can be pretty dumb. Anyone in a Walmart could one day wind up on a jury that decides your fate. Terrifying thought. That's legal realism. The other philosophy was critical theory. It's a philosophy rooted in Marxism. It purports that society is composed of oppressors and the oppressed, and the primary goal of scholarship should be to find and reveal systems of oppression. For example, the system of pro-wrestling fans oppressing all the people in their surrounding area who have to smell them. That's critical theory. These two academic theories fused together into a new field of study called critical legal studies. It claims the American legal system really is a way for those in power to maintain the status quo. It didn't take long before some academics started saying, well, who are those in power and who are they keeping down? Obviously, the answer is white people keeping down non-white people. And in 1989, critical race theory was born. It says that American society and American institutions are inherently divided along racial lines into two groups, oppressors, white people, and oppressed, everyone else, but especially black people. America's social systems and institutions, especially the legal system, are inherently oppressive, racist, and unjust, and therefore should be challenged, overturned, transformed, and ignored at every conceivable opportunity. Personally, 
I believe it's wealth and not race that inherently divides America, and the legal system favors the wealthy. That's why instead of being in prison for murder, O.J. Simpson is now killing it on Twitter. But that's just my opinion. Let's take a look at what a couple of the founders of critical race theory have to say about it. After a short break. Welcome back. In 1995, two of the founders of critical race theory wrote a book, Critical Race Theory, an introduction. It's a bit dense. Keep in mind we're talking about an academic theory in a long family line of academic theories. Dense is in its DNA. But don't worry. We're going to critically analyze each of the six main tenets of critical race theory. Wait, don't click away. It'll be fun. Okay, it'll be interesting. Well, at least it'll be factual to the best of our knowledge and soundly interpreted to the best of our ability. And it'll give you ammunition when an argument about critical race theory inevitably comes up at Thanksgiving dinner tomorrow. Can't really promise more than that. Ten one, racism is the norm. Critical race theory holds that racism is the default state of American society. Racism is the usual way society does business the common, everyday experience of most people of color in this country. So instead of asking, was such and such person subjected to racism, it asks, in what way was such and such person subjected to racism? It starts with the assumption that racism took place, and then goes looking for it to justify its own assumption. It's kind of like the scientific method, but backwards, and not very scientific. Ten and two, color blindness is disguised racism. Do you think we shouldn't judge people based on the color of their skin? Do you believe in racial equality? You're probably a racist. That's right, if you're colorblind, you're a racist. I'm looking at you, dogs. According to the book, colorblind or formal conceptions of equality, in other words, rules that insist only on treatment that is the same across the board, doesn't actually solve racism at a fundamental level. That's because of what the authors call interest convergence. The concept originally comes from Derrick Bell, the first black tenured Harvard Law School professor and the founding father of critical race theory. Interest convergence is a highbrow way of saying that white people will only help non-whites if it helps them as well. So if non-whites advance two steps, whites also make sure they themselves advance two steps. This way, non-whites always stay behind. It's the only foot race whites actually win over non-whites. Now you might be asking yourself, wasn't the civil rights movement, which included people of every race in America, successful in bringing down the racist Jim Crow system? Derrick Bell didn't think so. You know, the founding father of critical race theory? In this article, Bell writes that desegregation focuses on creating a discrimination-free environment, but that doing so has become increasingly ineffective. So he argues for the creation or preservation of model black schools. He also talks about a potentially troublesome lack of sympathy for racial separateness as a possible expression of group solidarity. So racial segregation is bad, but racial separateness is good? I'm sure it'll be fine, as long as it's separate but equal. Interest convergence essentially blows up the political philosophy upon which the U.S. legal system is based. Liberalism. Critical race theory says due process, equal treatment under the law, rationalism, reason over emotion, and objectivity are actually a centuries-long confidence game perpetrated by whites against non-whites. So even if whites become true believers in critical race theory, become anti-racist, and spend literally every waking moment trying to fight racism, by default, they must be advancing their own interests, which maintains their dominance over non-whites and makes racism impossible to root out and defeat as long as whites are involved. But simply, everything whites do to combat racism actually promotes racism merely because whites are the ones who are doing it. Thus, whiteness is racism. Tenant three, race is an unscientific social construct. The general idea of this tenant is that the entire concept of race is solely a product of social thought and relations, 
and is unrelated to human biology or genetics. Kind of like NFTs. It also says in the same paragraph, people with common origins share certain physical traits, of course, such as skin color, physique, and hair texture. And that's a result of genetics. Anyway, the idea is that race is merely a social construct with no scientific basis. Not the first evidence we've seen that science isn't this theory's strong suit. Society frequently chooses to ignore these scientific facts and creates races. Well, that's not entirely true. Genetics predispose some groups to certain diseases. For instance, black people are more prone to sickle cell disease. Ashkenazi Jewish people are more prone to Tay-Sachs disease. And British people are more prone to creepy transparent eyebrows disease. I hope that's not contagious. But the biological way of looking at race is only part of it. There's also a subjective social way. The black race, Asian race, white race, Irish race, and so on. For example, here's a colonial Spanish painting that categorizes people of various racial combinations. While it wasn't racist to categorize people based on racial heritage, it was racist when the Spanish colonists used the categories to create a race-based hierarchy and assign different arbitrary moral values to each one. Essentially, it was the colonial version of this Family Guy meme. And making Family Guy references is always wrong. Except when I did it just now. So why do societies create subjective definitions of race? That brings me to the next tenet of critical race theory. Tenet 4. Whites stereotype non-whites to suit the shifting needs of white society. So if critical race theory believes race is a social construct, why does society create different races? The dominant society racializes different minority groups at different times in response to shifting needs. There are a few reasons why this happens, but the primary concern for critical race theory is the dominant society does it to oppress a minority. In America, it would mean white society oppressing non-whites. Here's a good example. In colonial America prior to 1676, both blacks and whites could be chattel bond laborers, which is essentially slavery, but for a fixed number of years. Kind of like an unpaid internship. I wonder how often slave owners said, you're being paid in experience. Like slaves, chattel bond laborers got similar treatment from their masters lived in similar conditions, performed similar work, endured similar punishments, and around 80% of them, irrespective of race, died in servitude. What happened in 1676 that changed things? Bacon's Rebellion. Nathaniel Bacon led a mass bond laborer revolt in the colony of Virginia. 6,000 white and 2,000 black bond laborers took up arms against their masters and drove the colonial governor back to England, stopping tobacco production for 14 months. Eventually, government forces came back and reasserted control. And to prevent another slave rebellion, the colonial government came up with an idea. Divide and conquer. They sentenced black rebels to lifetime chattel bondage. The white rebels were punished with only an extension of their chattel bonds. The hope was this would prevent the white and black slaves from ever working together again. This system of racial slavery then essentially became law thanks to the Virginia Slave Codes of 1705. This system of manufactured racial animus would last almost three centuries, really only being stopped by the Civil Rights Movement in the 1960s. But remember interest convergence? White society will only act to benefit white society. So according to critical race theory, the civil rights movement was actually white racism in disguise. Whites only allowed it to happen because it served white interests. If you take this idea to its logical conclusion, then whites are racist if they speak up against racism, since interest convergence means whites will only speak up if doing so also happens to be in their own interest. And whites are also racist if they don't speak up, since silence is consent. Quite a catch-22, isn't it? Take the phrase white silence equals white consent and replace white with female and see how that sounds. And if you say white female silence equals white female consent, then that proves that Helen Keller was a racist. After all, she was also colorblind. 
She only helped co-found the ACLU because it served white interests, like affirmative action. We'll look at the final two tenets of critical race theory after this last ad break. Welcome back. So let's sum up again to make sure we're all on the same page. Critical race theory claims racism is omnipresent and touches every social relation and interaction. Color blindness and other liberal concepts are actually expressions of racism. Still looking at you, dogs. The very concept of race isn't grounded in science, and stereotypes change over time to serve the immediate needs of white society. Now for the last two tenets. Tenet 5. Critical race theory is intersectional. This is where things really start to fall apart for critical race theory. It says, no person has a single, easily stated, unitary identity. Now obviously that's true. You can't really stereotype individuals. For instance, by saying, all whites are racist, or all blacks feel oppressed. But that's not what critical race theory teaches. Everyone has potentially conflicting, overlapping identities, loyalties, and allegiances. So, for instance, if you're the child of a black and white person, where's your loyalty, huh? Well, in Obama's case, that's easy. His corporate donors. Fun side note, did you know twins can be different races? Ugh, just look at that racist baby. Are they speaking yet? White female silence equals white female consent. So what happens if you look white, but aren't white? Like Michael Jackson. Or vice versa. Like Justin Trudeau. How does critical race theory treat them? This is where practical application of critical race theory can be really disastrous. Last year, black mom Gabrielle Clark sued her high school son's charter school. Clark's son, William, who is biracial, was given a failing grade in a sociology class because he didn't want to confess his white dominance. According to the lawsuit, William is generally regarded as white by his peers and, despite having a black mother, is so light-skinned he is usually presumed white by all others. The lawsuit also says William is the only light-skinned student in his sociology class and is regularly reminded of it. The sociology class had a lot of elements inspired by critical race theory. For example, Students were asked to fill out a form listing all of their identities and whether those identities were oppressive or oppressed. Students who fell into oppressive categories were told to accept they were oppressors. When William refused to disclose his identities, he was told he would fail the class if he didn't do the assignment. When he asked to take another class instead, he was told if he didn't take this class, he wouldn't be allowed to graduate high school. So a biracial kid who looks white was told to either accept his identity as an oppressor or fail out of high school. On the other hand, Justin Trudeau is still Prime Minister of Canada. And finally, Tenant 6, Voice of Color. This tenant has some sensible ideas, but some less than ideal implications. The Voice of Color thesis holds that because of their different histories and experiences with oppression, Black, Indian, Asian, and Latino writers and thinkers may be able to communicate to their white counterparts matters that the whites are unlikely to know. Yep, this is completely reasonable. People have different experiences, and the only way to learn about those is to talk about it. Except furries. I'm very tolerant of your lifestyle, it's just, I don't want to hear about it. This leads into the idea of legal storytelling. It urges black and brown writers to recount their experiences with racism and the legal system, and to apply their own unique perspectives to assess law's master narratives. This is also pretty important. A lot of people have had bad experiences with the U.S. legal system. It's not limited to black and brown people, but certainly it's a real problem they've faced. And writing about it is good. If nobody actually brought up grievances they had with American institutions, how could we possibly take any meaningful action to address injustices that took place and build a better system? We should be able to leave a review for America on Yelp. 50 stars? More like three and a half old glory. The biggest concern with the idea of storytelling in a legal system is that it elevates personal feelings over evidence. 
If the legal system is based on racism, like CRT claims it is, then it doesn't matter what the actual evidence says. Instead, you have to look at extra-legal things like race. That's why to some, Kyle Rittenhouse will always be guilty no matter what the jury said, because he's white in a system designed to favor whites. Even though the people he shot were also white. So does that mean if Rittenhouse was found guilty, that verdict would also have been racist? The idea that racism is a part of all systems in the U.S. also leads to people blaming white supremacy for an incident where a person drove a car through a holiday parade in Wisconsin, killing several people. Whether or not the attacker was white, white supremacy was still the cause. If you view the world through the lens of critical race theory, then people's races are always relevant, in every situation. I'm pretty sure the word used to describe people who hold such a worldview is racist. So to sum up, critical race theory says racism is everywhere, liberalism is in fact racism, racial stereotypes serve white interests, people are best represented as identity groups and not as individuals, and people of color's feelings trump objective facts. And just because justice is blind doesn't mean it can't be racist. Just look at Helen Keller. This is why critical race theory is so controversial. Though from a critical race theory lens, it's only considered controversial because white power is being threatened. Across the nation, schools have been banning critical race theory in schools. But you might have heard people say things like this. There isn't any critical so race theory. It's a legal theory not taught in public schools it's in Virginia. So Let's be clear. Critical race theory is not taught in elementary schools or middle schools or high schools. It's a method of examination taught in law school and in college that helps analyze whether systemic racism exists. But now that you have a better idea of what critical race theory is, you can see how ideas from critical race theory might still be entering K-12 schools. It's sort of like how college-level drama classes aren't taught in high school, and yet high schoolers are the most dramatic people on the planet. Take Loudoun County, Virginia, for example. The school district developed a 22-page plan to combat systemic racism. Here's what it looked like in action. Tell me what, what this seems to be a picture of. It's just two people chilling. Right, just two people. <laughs> There's nothing more to this picture? Nah, not really. Just two people chilling. I don't believe that you believe that. I, I'm, I'm confused on what you would like me to, to speak on in that I don't sense. think you are. I don't know why you do this. Um, I'm not trying to call you out, but you could, you, you, you know, you come out off of mute to talk about what this is a picture of, and you act as if, as if, you know, there's nothing noticeable about this apart from the fact that there are two people. Well, I'm confused. Are you trying to get me to say that there are two different races in this picture? Yes, is that I what you want me to, to say? That. Well, at the end of the day, wouldn't that just be feeding into the problem of looking at race instead of just acknowledging them as two normal people? No, it's not because you you can't not look at you can't like, you can't look at the people and not acknowledge that there are racial differences, right? Sounds a bit like critical race theory to me. In fact, here's a guide for teachers that encourages them to integrate critical race theory into their geometry lessons because CRT can be applied everywhere. Before you know it, schools will be showing a movie about the racist history of math. And that movie, of course, will be called Square Roots, featuring O.J. Simpson, math is racist. After all, it literally teaches us division. So what do you think about critical race theory? Let us know in the comments. And remember, America Uncovered is mainly supported by viewers like you. So head on over to our Patreon page. Contribute a dollar or more per episode so we can keep making great content for you. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. Thanks for watching America Uncovered.